All right. What's going on, everyone? Joe and Mike back from buildassetsonline.com. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Well, not really Mr., but Black Vito. He uh, has a YouTube channel himself. Uh, what's the name of your YouTube channel real quick? It's Black Vito Moneyology, right? Yeah, Black Vito Moneyology. Awesome, awesome. So uh, we're going to be having a bunch of different guests on uh, going forward to kind of you know mix with our regular content about online business. Obviously, it's going to be... Uh, you know, money, income, wealth related. Um, so we reached out to Black Vito and asked him what he wanted to talk about. And so today's topic is how to build build wealth on uh, any income. But uh, we'll start with building wealth on a low income, uh, building wealth on a high income, uh, probably a little easier. Obviously, things can still go wrong. Um, but we're going to talk about it today. It's going to be it's going to be an interesting show. And I'm very excited for it. So welcome, Mike. How's it going? It's going good. I'm having some uh, connection issues, but I think we're we're stabilized now. All systems go. And yeah, thank you, uh, Black Vito, for coming on. So yeah, I mean, if you don't mind, it's my pleasure. people that are new to you and your channel and your methods, uh, do you mind giving us a little bit of an intro and talking about your background? All right. Awesome. So basically, a little bit about my background. I... And well, right about now, and as some of y'all might have saw in the Millennial Money video, maybe not. Um, I am a manager of a tax office. I'm probably going to leave that job soon, but I'm a manager of a tax office. Uh, I work on YouTube videos, so I make YouTube videos. I do Uber and Lyft. And one of the things well, that I and we'll run about. oh, sorry. and one of the things that I do, yeah, sorry, there's a. Um, anyway, so one of the things that I do is um, just investing as well, stock investing, and I do a little bit of, you know, the typical ETF type investing, and then also stocks, money related things, taxes, economic, finance, which is what how I define moneyology is the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary study of economics, finance, and accounting. Cool. I was having a little bit of a connection issue. Um, what did you say? You said you did ETFs and what else? Sorry, you're kind of like lagging a little bit. I'm lagging? Just a little bit. Yeah, just yeah. repeat what you said. Yeah. So basically, um, I said that I do some ETF investing, most of my retirement accounts, or well, entirely my retirement accounts. And then on top of that, as far as my non-retirement accounts, I buy individual stocks. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when some, I see, it kind of seems like to me, like you're coming at this from gathering a lot of income streams, which is good. And then investing it into, into different places. So can you kind of explain kind of like, I guess how you started and how you chose to start to do like what you do? Obviously you're doing YouTube, which I guess can be it can kind of turn into more of a passive income stream, but everything else you're doing, like the job, the Uber, the Lyft is more of like a, like a not passive income stream. So can you explain like, mm. you know, what you're going for, the method behind every, everything you're doing and kind of, I guess, get a, get a little bit more granular with how you try and like manage your income and what you invest into like every month or something. Do you have like a budget or something like that? Yeah. So to start off with that end question, I, I don't really consider myself as having, having a budget. Some people would say that I do, but as far as generally speaking, I don't really go for a whole bunch of streams of income necessarily. Really, I try to go with things that I think that I'm interested in. So, I mean, that's not necessarily the best thing for everybody because if you're interested in, I don't know, doing art and you know maybe you're not that good at it, maybe that might not be the best thing but for me i'm i'm very interested in taxes for example and i know that i can make money during taxes but that's only tax season um i used to go door to door um but i decided that for me that just wasn't for me so i was doing door to door and uber and lyft but then i stopped doing door to door to do uber i uh, just to do uber and lyft and then that gave me a little bit more free time to work on my youtube channel so during the tax season i'm doing taxes you know, Uber and Lyft, and then working on the YouTube channel during off season, during, not during tax season. I just focus on 
doing uh, Uber and Lyft just to bring in that income. And then that gives me something to invest with. But also the thing I like about Uber and Lyft, people always talk about how low the income is, but it allows me to be very flexible with my schedule. Because if I was had a job, I wouldn't be here right now. And I would probably have to be working right now. Mm-hmm. So are you a CPA? I am not a CPA. Okay, so what, usually when it comes down, sorry. Well, I was going to ask for people See, that may not understand. So you said that you're doing taxes. Um, what's kind mm-hmm. of the, the the difference between a CPA and what you do? So a CPA is a certified public accountant. So that's a person who basically went to college for four years, got an accounting degree, and then they took uh, multiple exams to get what they call a certified public accountant. So I would really say it's kind of like bringing a bazooka to a fist fight when it comes down to doing most people's taxes. <laughs> so for me, I feel like, I mean, if you're doing business tax returns or if you're auditing someone's taxes, then yes, yeah, CPA would probably be the best. But very simple tax returns, you all you really need to do is study very hard. I mean, in Maryland, you can't do taxes without uh, having a license. So you have to pass a, a one test that is very, very hard to test. Most people don't pass the first time. Um, and, you know, so that is a very difficult test. And then also they make you test a little bit on the state as well, like a little bit of the state laws. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's how they do it in Maryland. Not every place is like that. But when it comes down to the tax law, really, there's no between doing two things, reading the tax law and doing taxes. If you read the tax law and do taxes, you'll get you'll get very good. Okay, cool. So yeah, I mean, so obviously you're a bit familiar with the type of businesses that we do. You know, we do online related businesses. So we have students and, you know, they'll come to us. We teach them the basics of, you know, you want to set up an LLC or some sort of entity to cover yourself. And then we teach them how to generate income online, whether it's through Shopify or Amazon or creating their own blog, that type of thing. So let's say someone is doing this, they're starting to generate their income um, enough to cover, you know, business expenses, enough to cover living expenses. And now they have some money that is left over. They're starting to build a little bit of a a stash and nest egg. So what would you say is like the first thing you'd want to do once you start having that extra stockpile of money as a business? Well, I would say since the, since you're kind of starting off like kind of like a small business a lot of the times when we have a small business your personal finances end up very mixed in to your business finances like if you are doing really really bad with your personal finances then you're, that could very easily affect your your business finances so i would say that if you have like on your, in your business or in your personal life very very high levels of like let's say for example credit card debt anything that's high interest i mean very rarely someone who who has that type of mindset would have like a payday loan or something like that but anything that you have that has very very high interest that's the first thing that i would try to eliminate just right off the back um just to kind of you know eliminate that out the way and then from there i would kind of figure out what is the plan because all right some people would say all right we'll take some of that money and go put in the stock market Okay, but if you're doing this business here, this, uh, you know, online, you know, selling things online, maybe it's not best to go invest that money in someone else's business. How about you invest it in your business, which has the higher probability or higher possibility, rather, of a very large return on investment. So I will look for first ways after I obviously got rid of the high credit card debt or anything like that. I'll look for ways to grow the business that I'm working on now. A perfect example of that is just uh, the over the weekend, I spent about a thousand dollars, a thousand and eighty nine dollars on YouTube equipment and YouTube stuff because I see potential in there. I've already made some money, so I see potential. So that means I'm just going to go a little bit harder. It took me a very long time before I put that type of money in there. So instead of going investing that thousand dollars in the stock market, why not invest in something that I have more control over? And that can uh, give me a higher return on investment, possibly. Yeah, and that's definitely something we always say. Obviously, you don't want to be in credit card debt just from like bad purchases personally. And yeah, so obviously that's something you should definitely eliminate off the bat. You don't want to 
have that type of thing following you around. And yes, we're, we're personally, I don't really invest in stocks at all because to me, if I'm going to go and put that money into the stock market, I'd rather put it into something that I'm already familiar with. And I feel like I, I have no control over the stock market. I think for me to execute it well, it would take a lot of extra time researching companies and understanding different things about it. So it's a whole separate thing that I'd be forced to dive into. But so let's say, you know, someone's paid off their uh, personal debt, all that, all that type of stuff and their business, you know, like for us, for example, a lot of times we reach a point where we don't want to keep reinvesting. We can't re we can't invest all the money that we have back into the business because it mm-hmm. would just, it's, it's just not feasible, you know, because, uh, really, you know, we have the equipment we need. We're growing things at a rate that we're comfortable with. And so we wind up with this extra stockpile of cash. So at that point, if you're not going to put it back into your exact business, as far as like passive options, what would you say is a good idea? So you're saying that you can't, put, you don't want to put it back in your business, but you don't want to put in stocks either. Is that where you're getting at? Well, I just mean like stocks in, in the traditional sense of buying individual stocks and trading. I mean, we mm-hmm. can get into, you know, doing uh, index funds and, and and stuff like that. So when you when you say put it into the stock market, are you saying go and buy Apple stock or are you saying, you know, go on Vanguard and, and do some sort of money market thing? Well, it when it comes down to when you have a pile of cash and you don't know what you want to do with it, that really, I mean, if you don't want to reinvest it back into the business that you're working on, then that's when you have to start looking at alternatives. First off, you have to ask yourself why you don't want to invest it back into your business for whatever reason. And if you can't find that a good reason, then maybe you want to find some other alternative. You know, for example, maybe look, if you, depending on how much you have, you might want to look into real estate. If you, if that's something you have more control over than the stock market. But then that requires, once again, time, effort, education. But once again, it just depends on what you are willing to sacrifice and what is the opportunity cost versus what you're getting in return. And are you willing to, you know, make that sacrifice of time and effort buying and researching to find real estate properties? If you kind of just want to put that money somewhere else to invest because you don't want to reinvest it in your business, then what I would suggest, what I'm not going to say what I would suggest, what I would personally probably do is between, if you don't want to buy individual stocks, then I would say put it in like an ETF. That's my personal preference. So can you- And it's my- Sorry, can I want to- get back to the original topic in a second, but um, can you actually define what an ETF is? Because uh, I think compared to Mike, I actually keep a lot more money in stocks. I have a lot more money in like mutual funds and retirement accounts and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I always, you know, do that every year. So actually like a lot of a lot of the cash that I, well, it's not really cash, but a lot of the money that I have that's somewhat liquid is in that kind of stuff. But can you actually define what an ETF is? So an ETF is what they call an exchange traded fund. And depending on how deep you want to get, you can get it can get complicated. But th- at the very basics, what you're doing is you're taking a pool of investors money, putting it together in a, like a fund, and then they're investing it in a whole wide range of different types of stocks or other types of investments other than stocks. So really what you're doing is you're taking a a bunch of investors money you're pulling it together and then you're putting it in a bunch of different whatever type of investment the etf is supposed to be tracking so what the etf does is it tracks whatever market that it claims to track so yes say for example one is the s p 500 and this is what they might call like a passively managed etf where it's just meant to follow what the top 500 or more country uh uh companies in the US are doing in the actual stock market. So, and then also it's usually weighted based off size. So that's probably not the best explanation for a beginner, but just for the very beginner, I would say it's basically a pool of money 
and where you can kind of buy multiple different stocks or multiple different investments at once. It doesn't it just need to be stocks. There are funds were for bonds because, you know, buying individual bonds can be very, very, you know, complicated in, in ways for a new investor. So buying an ETF would give you multiple different bonds and at once. And it, it offers a lot more liquidity than regular bonds. By liquidity means it's easier to sell. Would a REIT be considered an ETF? I, I don't I don't think so. I think that there are REIT ETFs, meaning ETFs that buy a whole bunch of REITs, which is kind of like a derivative buying a derivative in a way. But um, but, yeah. you know, a, a real, a REIT is a real estate investment trust, which is kind of a kind of a different thing. It really is kind of just like a a type of business entity. You know, you have C corporation, you have S corporation. I kind of look at it like, and this is just how I think about it. I'm not saying this is the technical definition. This is how I think about it. I kind of think about it like it's kind of just a type of business entity that offers different tax advantages and different other disadvantages, depending on how you look at it. And it's a way for an investor to invest in multiple real estate properties without having to actually have the money to buy real estate properties. It's kind of like you're buying a stock that buys a bunch of different real estate properties. So as far as an ETF differing from like a regular mutual fund, because you could buy a mutual fund of the S&P 500. Um, so it seems like an ETF is more uh, more dynamic in a way. Like you can buy an ETF that tracks like like tech stuff. I, I still don't understand the difference between an ETF and a mutual fund. Yeah. So a mutual fund, there's a few different, well, mutual funds, funds are well one of the biggest difference is that etfs trade on the stock market like stocks you know what i'm saying like you know you can go and buy they have ticker symbols just like stocks and you can go out and you can go buy them on the market just like a regular stock there are other different tax advantages relative uh, for etf funds relative to mutual funds one of the biggest differences is that Mutual, mutual funds are usually actively managed. So what that means is that the person who's running the mutual fund usually is trying to beat the stock market. So they're not necessarily trying to match the stock market. Usually a lot of the times, not, not all the time, but a lot of the times they're trying to beat the market and uh, usually they fail to do so. Yeah. So also I'm they usually charge higher fees. So mutual funds typically charge higher fees for management fees because it's a little bit more active, whereas ETFs, they're trying to kind of passively just kind of do what the stock market is doing sometimes. So someone running a mutual fund would be buying ETFs. I mean, for trading, they probably could do that, but they probably wouldn't do that. They'll probably be buying individual uh, stocks. They're probably like they'll be buying directly Apple. Okay. They'll be buying you know all these other companies tesla whatever a lot of the times mutual funds they'll be trying to find some way to perform to either match the market or beat the market mm. i don't want to get too far off to, off track from the original topic but i think this is a lot of like good background information um for for the original topic that we uh, that we were that we were talking about so we were discussing like if you are on a low income or you have a lot of debt and you're trying to build wealth, the first thing that you should do is to pay off your debt, obviously. Get rid of all that high interest, specifically the high interest debt. Um, Cause that's just gonna, you know, never allow you to build wealth. It's gonna be like a, like an anchor, you know, holding you down. But exactly. so once, once that happens, where should someone go? Because I wanna, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about how we think about it. And then you can kind of talk about how you think about it and, you know, give some, tips or insights that other people might um, might find useful. So a few years ago, Mike and I read this book called The, uh, the Millionaire Fast Lane. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually after we got started in online business. And before that, I was kind of familiar with the philosophy of like the, the, the retire early thing, like the fire thing, the financial independence retire early, where you just put a bunch of, you have a bunch of money, you know, into a mutual fund or, or like, yeah, like into a mutual fund, you would draw like 4% a year and then you can, you can live like that. Or, you know, you just 
what or what most people do is they just you know passively invest into their 401k into their IRA or whatever and then by 60 65 they'll have you know a couple million dollars that they can live off of but what the um what that book i mentioned the millionaire fast lane gets into is that like business is really the best and the only way to um make it happen so that it doesn't ha- so you don't have to wait until you're 65 and then all your best years are behind you. So that's where the online business stuff comes in for us because we realize that we can create these online businesses and then sell them for like a multiple with without without very much risk cuz it's all digital. It's not like opening up a a brick and mortar store. So that kind of works in your favor. Is like you can start a website literally for nothing and have it be worth like hundred thousand dollars or more, like over, like in a sh- very short amount of time. Um, so someone is, you know, low, low, lower income. They don't have very much money. They've budgeted. They've got rid of all their high interest debt. Um, what do you recommend, like doing to get yourself on that path to, to wealth? And what do you think the path is to, to, to like either retire or retire early or you know however however you want to talk about it. Yeah, so I think that you just said a very key thing. The very key thing that you said is you did something that a lot of people don't do. Even people who went to college is you read a book. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you read a book. That, that I mean that is a very great start. If you read a book, I learn. If you learn something, then how can you, you know, you Go and you try to start an online business, but you don't know anything about starting an online business. You have you didn't learn anything. You just kind of just kind of wing it. It's probably not going to be the best way to do it. You got people like you who create channels that talk about it, help people out. There's so many channels out there that's about helping people out. So you, I feel like the first thing you want to do is acquire what they call human capital, which is the skills and abilities to actually do things. So if you don't, if you are a lower income people, you got a little bit of money saved up. You need to invest your time or your money into acquiring some type of higher income skill, something that's going to give you a higher potential upside potential. Usually, like you mentioned, a job or, you know, investing in the stock market can only increase that potential by so much. So many people always bring up to me, well, Jerome, yeah, stock investing is cool and all, but I don't want to be rich when I'm 60 years old. Neither do I. I want to be rich as soon as possible as well. So for me, I feel like I do invest in the stock market, but I do focus on in things that I feel that I personally can do and that I want to do to build a substantial amount of wealth. Now, I feel like I emphasize in my own life doing what I want to do more than probably the average person needs to or probably would want to. But and that probably is part of the reason why I'm not wealthier than I than I am now, because I f- more focus more on what trying to do the things, make money in ways that I want to. One of the ways is obviously uh, YouTube. But I would say that so the first thing that person would need, want to do is try to invest their time or their money into in skills that are going to produce them income. I'm, I'm yeah, learning skills to produce the income. Once they acquire those skills. The skills that they should probably focus on are skills that have a very large upside potential. Online businesses are not going anywhere. I mean, they're going to be here for a long time. So when you have an online business, even if that specific business is not around, maybe you're selling something that goes out of way. If you have those skills, you can go start another online business in some way, other shape or form. So you guys are there, you guys might start a business and you might sell it. You guys have the skills to go out there and start another online business. That's what you would want to do as a lower income person is to acquire skills that you can continue to generate higher and higher levels of income and ideally in ways that require less time and maybe even less effort. Yeah, it's funny you say that actually because that's like verbatim what we preach and try to tell people is what, what we focus on and the business models that we teach specifically, it's designed so that you're actually developing skills. And so, yeah, you could sell a website, but you retain all the skills. And what you're doing is going to like you 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 will only increase in skill because there's other business models you can do online or not. 
that your income or, you know, once you learn it, you learn it. But like what we do, if you're doing this for one year, you'll be, you know, you'll be somewhere, you'll be doing good. But five years later, you'll be much more of an expert. You become, you know, basically close to mastery. And then six years, seven years, you can start becoming an authority. And now that one skill, while it allows you to create one website, it can allow you to create 10 websites. It can allow you to create your own course, create a YouTube channel. So yeah, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And, you know, a lot of times with online business now, you don't have to be in the US to do it. So like a lot of times people are screwed because they have to pay a high amount of rent or, you know, they they were bound by their location. Now, you know, we have this cliche idea of these, uh, you know, digital nomads or whatever, but if that's feasible for you to do, if it's feasible for you to get a plane and go live somewhere cheap, I mean, that's, that can have a whole other level of implication because now your cost of living is way down. And so you can afford to learn these skills and it's not a matter of, can I pay my bills this month or not? Yeah, I think that, and this might be a little bit off the, the path we were going, but I think that's a very key point is that when you're doing things online, and that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to focus and in a different way than you guys, but I'm trying to focus on making money online is because when you do things online, you can move kind of anywhere you want to as long as you have internet access really and if you move to a lower cost area you are literally raising your income just by moving through a lower cost area and you can do that if you're you know work online remotely yeah and i mean there's even i don't know there's even things you can do like uh learn to code that you don't have to even you don't have to pay for it until you graduate right and it, you know you can get some sort of remote thing you can do freelance but i don't, I don't want to get into all of that but um as far as like living overseas are there tax implications for that mm -hmm. yeah well there are definitely tax implications for that when it comes down to living overseas and doing taxes and stuff like that i haven't encountered that now i've done you know like I don't know, maybe, four, you know, close to 400 tax returns in my, well, probably over 400 tax returns in my life. But I haven't experienced too many people who was working overseas and there. So that's somewhat outside of the, the area of my expertise, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I would say that there are, from what I know, there are definitely tax consequences. Like, for example, depending on how the tax treatment uh, how that country taxes our citizens will depend on how we tax their citizens and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So if there's a tax tree, sometimes you're living in another country. Sometimes you won't have to pay United States taxes if you pay taxes to that government and that government allows the same type of treatment and the other, you know, the other way around. Sometimes in certain places you might have to, I, from my understanding, you have to might have to renounce your United States citizenship in order to kind of live there and not pay U.S. taxes mm. or do like a U.S. tax return. Interesting. So that that can get a little bit more complicated. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's definitely implications to that. But sometimes, once again, if you go to another country, and I mean, I wouldn't be willing to give up my U.S. citizenship, but if you go to another country, sometimes the 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 money that you would save would be substantial you just by because some places will have a significantly lower tax rate especially on businesses than other places so sometimes it might it would be another way to increase your income with, or at least increase your bottom line income without necessarily increasing your top line income so are taxes you said you you, you do taxes because you're interested in them so is that one of those uh, those human capital higher uh, profit skills that you did, or was that just something you did just before you even thought of that? Yeah, well, there was a few different reasons why I got into the taxes, and I'll get into that in a second. But I would say that it can be a higher level skill. It can be a low income skill. It can be a higher level skill. When you're like I said earlier, like. When you're doing typical people's taxes, even if they have some investment or some rental income or whatever, 
like you're doing the average person's taxes, even if they do have some slightly complicated returns, for the most part, it's pretty simple. And, you know, getting a very high level uh, of education uh, is kind of like bringing a bazooka, like I said, to, to a, a fist fight. But I would say that, that, you know, those are gonna be the lower income type of skills. I mean, that's gonna be lower income. If you can learn how to do more complex returns, more complex situations, and basically cater your skills to higher income people, then that's when your skills start to become higher income. So yes, learning the tax law can be uh, high income. And I'm taking this from the perspective that you're working for someone else. Even in doing low income people, like very simple tax returns, working for yourself, I mean, a simple tax return, you can like make $50 a profit and do the tax return in 20 minutes. I think the quickest tax return I've ever done was like in like six minutes, approximately somewhere thereabouts. So like, and then if I was working on my, for myself instead of for a company, I might have been make about $50 a profit off of that. So take me about 20 minutes to do it and then make about $50 a profit. So even simple tax returns can be high level income if you're doing it for yourself. Working for someone else though, which you know we can get into entrepreneurship or whatever but working for someone else you're not going to make a lot of money unless you're doing high level tax returns and then at that point typically not always you're probably going to need a degree i've had job offers where that's not necessarily the case but um higher level tax places you're probably going to need a degree or you need to be at least trying to get a degree mm -hmm. i, I kind of want to segue into um the type of differences between earning a high income as an employee versus owning a high income as a business owner. But I do want to add something about like, we were talking about, you know, your low income, like you, you can build a skill or I think, you know, how you're saying you're doing Uber and Lyft. I think stuff like that as part of, you know, this uh, new world that we're living in, you know, you have Uber, Lyft, uh, you can become like an Amazon shopper. There's so many different flexible types of ways to earn income now that you can you can learn the skills that you need to be successful at business um, in your own time, but still, you know, make enough money to pay your bills and, and live a, a sustainable life doing these different types of uh, gig things. So this is like, that never existed before. There wasn't online business. There wasn't, you know, an app that is your job and you can go and make money whenever. So things are becoming a lot more flexible for people, but, yeah, I mean, let's say let's say you have a degree and you're trying to work your way your way up the corporate ladder and you know you're developing this high level skill versus someone who just started, you know, a uh, a modest small business and they're making the same amount of of profit. I mean, what are the the tax differences there? Well, when it comes when it comes down to the employee Depending on the tax return, tax or well, tax professional that the business owner is using, the employee might end up paying more taxes. Usually, if they're just straight income, they'll probably end up paying more taxes. Now, if the business owner doesn't have a good tax preparer, they could very well be end up paying more in taxes. Let's say, for example, that person is let's say someone is making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of profit before taxes you take in the, to account that yes say for example this person was a sole proprietorship they're going to have to pay about 15.3 percent in self-employment taxes on that income whereas the employee would only have to pay about 7.5 percent you know with fica taxes so fica taxes you know the so, uh, medicare and social security tax it's kind of intended to be the same thing as the self-employment tax of 15.7 percent that's the reason why it's about two times that amount so um the point there is that depending on how the business owner is set up will depend on how many how much taxes they end up paying mm. so if a person is a you know they don't set up a some type of business like a, let's say for example s corporation maybe a c corporation they might end up paying more taxes than the employee that's one thing that some business owners do a lot, and I've seen this do, during during doing taxes. They will make the employee uh, like uh, a business in in a way by making them a contractor, 
like a freelancer, so to speak. So they don't have to pay as much, you know, employment taxes that the employer has to pay. So that means the person will be thinking they get paid more, but come tax time, they have to pay all of these other taxes that they would not have had to pay if they were considered an employee. So it really depends on the type of business entity you have. If you have an S corporation or a C corporation, or you have an LLC that you can get taxed as a S corporation or maybe a C corporation, you will you can find ways to lower your taxes. Mm-hmm. Even at you know, but once again, if you are you know making, yes, say for example, two hundred fifty thousand a year, and and that's your net profit from business. A lot of the times you can write off things that are otherwise personal expenses, but because you have a business, it turns into, you know, a non-personal expense if you actually use it for business, if you want to follow the law to the T. So I have this here cell phone. This cell phone has become a business expense ever since I started doing Uber and Lyft. Now I'm sitting here spending all this money on this cell phone. Now I'm not going to write it off on my taxes. Oh, well, what about my car insurance? My car insurance was an expense before. I have a business now. So now this, now my car insurance is being right off of my taxes. But the employee can't do that. Mm-hmm. Pretty much so many of your expenses can become personal expenses. Now you have a room that you're not using or maybe it's a closet or something like that. Well, maybe you can turn that room into an office. Now you have a business deduction. The employee can't do that. Yeah. So it gives you a lot more avenues to lower your taxes as an, uh, uh, as a business owner. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely a very solid point. Obviously, you know, Joe and I, we, we recommend people, they do set up some sort of entity, whether it's an LLC or an S corp or, or C corp, we tell them to talk to their, you know, CPA about that, but you're right. It gives you the ability to turn things that were expenses, just personal expenses into now deductions. So, to me, this is where I feel like you really started to, to get into playing the game. And this is what I think really the, the tax law is intended. I feel like the tax laws are there to push people to, you know, if you, if you own a business, to do things that will continue to grow their business and therefore grow the economy and create jobs and even, even create housing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, do you have any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, have you guys ever uh, heard of the book uh, "Tax Free Wealth" by Tom Wilwright? No, I've never read it. Well, um, that's one of the books I haven't read it completely yet, but that's one of the books I started reading today. So, um, well, technically, listen to audiobook with same shit. I mean, same stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, but um, so basically, that book is basically saying the same thing that you said. So he's basically talking about how to lower your taxes and how to you know do it, not loopholes, but just like regular things that you can do to lower your taxes. And basically what he says in that book is most of the tax code is written about ways to lower your taxes. And that's what I found as well. That's the reason why I felt that so much is because most of the taxes that you read, you look into the tax law, they're basically just telling you different ways that you can lower your taxes. Now you start off with this base amount of taxes you have to pay. The tax law is set up to lower your taxes, but they want to. You can only lower your taxes if you do what they want you to do. Mm-hmm. So if they exactly. want you to invest, they will give you a lower tax rate on your gains. They want you to invest for more than a year. They want you to be a long-term investor. So guess what? You pay less taxes on your long-term capital gains and also your long-term dividends than you do if you do short-term gains and short-term uh, dividends, so um, which is called qualified dividends, but whatever. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think people um, think of taxes as sort of like a penalization or like money being sucked away from them. And I mean, I wouldn't say I disagree, but I would have the caveat <laughs> of, uh, of the fact that it's like a penalization if you do something wrong. Yeah. So it's like they're the tax code is outlining the rules to the game. And the rules to the game are, you know, have them build create jobs, create wealth, and create housing. And so if you don't follow those rules, you'll be penalized accordingly. And one one thing I want to add, you can let let me know if you agree with this or not. Um anyone 
or mostly anyone like like it's not people think of a corporation as like they got a big building in the middle of the city and the you know the skyscraper and there's like a million people that work for it but like literally anyone could be a corporation you know it's not like a this crazy thing where you enjoy the same i'm not going to say you're going to enjoy the exact same tax luxuries of some of the biggest multinational corporations because obviously you know they're doing things that a normal person can never do but but you can become a corporation you know like you said start doing something like uber and lyft or some sort of part-time business where you start to enjoy those same tax benefits that a corporation does as an individual person i think that's what a lot of people don't realize is that like a corporation is like some evil entity out there, but you can also be a corporation, you know? <laughs> you can also be a yeah. evil entity. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people think corporations are evil entities. That, that's for sure, especially nowadays. But a corporation is just filling out paperwork. The same way you do your taxes, you can just fill out some paperwork and then now you're a corporation. Well, now you ha- you own a corporation and now you're the CEO of that corporation or the treasury of the board. You and your best friend can go down the street and go start an S corporation, a C corporation, and go talk to, I don't know, you can try to figure out how to do it on your own or maybe talk to some lawyers, whatever the case may be. But all it is is just a paperwork that you have to fill out. That's all it is. It's it's not this physical thing that you can touch. It's paperwork. Yeah. It's mm. a check on a box, so to speak. We got a comment. I wanna, oh, go yeah. ahead. Wait, before, we, let's read this comment first because I think it's important to the- That's what I was going to- the. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess I'll just do it. All right. So we're talking about taxes and we're talking about building wealth when you have a, you know, income that's not so large. And, um, Tom Hunter says, I think a big, the big thing that you guys are missing in this tax conversation is the impact of retirement and savings accounts where you can put away over 50 K a year as a write-off, depending on the account, you can use it for stocks or rentals. Some will, some will even let you get a mortgage against it. So assuming he's talking, he's talking about retirement accounts. So I'm assuming he's talking about like things like Roth IRAs, regular IR, traditional IRAs, 401ks, stuff like that. Um, yeah, well, it seems like what he's talking about, it wouldn't be like a Roth IRA because that's after yeah, tax. No, no, I'm no. assuming that he's talking about like pre-tax accounts. And th- those are ways you can reduce your tax liability. But you can do that even as an, uh, a self-employed individual. So you can find all the other ways you can lower your taxes being a – an, um, not an employee, but then you can go and still get the benefits that some employees think, you know, that their employer is giving them, but really they can be self-employed and get those same benefits. They just go to a brokerage, open up a solo 401k, I think that's what they call them, or, and then you can have a 401k right there. And actually I'm planning to do that very soon. That's one of the reasons why I brought that up. Um, uh, IRA, an individual retirement account. You can just open that up, right, uh, right up, a traditional IRA, and then that will give you some tax deductions right there. But if you are a lower income person and you unless you just plan to be lower income for the rest of your life, then it's almost always going to be better if you are starting from a low basis to do a lower tax amount. Because legally, I have paid nothing in taxes the last two years. And before that, my income was so insignificant that it didn't even matter because I was in college. So. But so the last two years, been nothing in taxes. It would be stupid for me to put my money in a 401k. I'm going to put, if I'm going to put my money in a retirement account, I'm going to put my money into an account that is not going to get taxed once I pull it out, assuming that I take it out when I'm 59 and a half. Obviously, the tax laws can change. But I would just say that you have to really look at it like this. Do you think that the tax laws are going to go down in the future by the time you retire? Do you think even if the tax law, your are in, even if the tax is lower, do you think that your income will be higher overall in a few years? Because if it's significantly higher in a few years, even then you still have to pay a lot more taxes in the future. And what you're doing really with a 401k or retirement account is you're prolonging those taxes in the future. You're not eliminating those taxes like a tax deduction might or a tax credit might. You are essentially pushing those taxes off into the future. And you don't know what the tax are going to be like in the future. So so I think it's definitely a good way to lower your taxes. I'm not saying it's bad at all. It's definitely a good way to lower your taxes for a lot of people. But I'm just saying that it, there are pros to cons to everything. 
if that makes sense, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I definitely want to get into how you paid no taxes the last two years. Um, but another thing I wanted to add is that as a, a, someone doing business, you're getting paid first. Whereas as an employee, you're, you're getting a check, you know, unless, unless you're a freelancer or a contractor, like you were alluding to before, you know, you're, you're getting paid first and then it's up to you really how you're going to spend that money. And then at, at the end of the year, you know, you, you would pay the taxes based on what you earned. And obviously the, you know, there's quarterly taxes you may pay and stuff like that. But that, that is a very important distinction is that you're getting your money pre-tax, whereas employees are getting their money. It's, it, it's already been taken out. Yeah, I think that definitely can make it, especially when interest rates are like a little bit more normal, perhaps, you know, or I don't know about normal, but like when they're not, you know, basically zero. If you can, you know, earn a little bit of just a little bit of extra interest on your money, just like this is just like a simple example. There's other things you can do with the money. Meanwhile, but yes, say, for example, you have three months. Yes, say you're making a lot of money. You're going to have to pay quarterly taxes. Otherwise, you probably might get some tax penalties. So you um. So you pay those three um, every three months. You have to pay, you know, send off money to the government. If you can go just make off if you're making a very large amount of money with your business, that little bit of time in which you are not, you know, you can make a little bit of interest with that money. And that will be something very simple and very safe to increase the amount of money you're making that an employee can't do. And that's just something simple and safe that you could do. Obviously, mm -hmm. you can go from that very simple thing to significantly more risky things. But uh, I remember I was watching a Berkshire Hathaway meeting and what's his name? Uh, uh, Charlie Munger said, you know, a lot of the times I would find ways to make enough money with the money to where though I can pay the taxes with the money that I made between the time I had to pay the taxes yeah. to where as though, you know, I actually received the money. So, yeah, that's a good that's point. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a uh, that that's certainly true. And that, you know even in the realm of what we do, it, it can definitely apply. I mean, I don't know, personally, I don't have the guts to say like, take all my uh, pre-tax income and just put it into like a high risk uh, investment account or something. But yeah, I mean, with that, say say you're gonna owe $20,000 in taxes over the course of a year. If you have that $20,000 over the year, you could put that, you know, we, we do things where we actually buy land and um, resell it. like. I could have t I could take that twenty thousand, buy a piece of land, and then sell it for sixty. And now, yeah, I've already paid my taxes through that extra bit of income I had. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a good insight. But you paid no taxes the last two years. So mm -hmm. what happened? How'd you do it? So uh, one of the main reasons is just income is lower, so it makes it easier. I mean, I feel like. A lot of people believe that it's easier to pay lower taxes if you're like a millionaire, but maybe if you're like a billion dollar corporation, it might be easier to pay nothing in taxes. But if you are an individual, uh, a lot of the times it's easier to lower your taxes if you already have low income, because just give you an, let me give you some explanation there. So as far as income taxes, and, and I should probably clarify that I have paid something in, uh, and what they call like payroll taxes or FICA taxes. And basically, like I said, self-employment tax is the equivalent of a FICA tax for self-employed people. So as far as income taxes, I pay nothing in income taxes. They have paid some self-employment taxes, which is, I think there's a mm -hmm. big difference between the two. So when it comes down to income taxes, um, you really have, if you have a low income already, you really just need to get your taxable income or adjusted gross income below 12,000 for 2019, at least it was 20, 12,200. And for 2020, I mean, 2018, it was 12,000 exactly. So 2019, 20, 12,200, and then 2018, 12,000. So basically from there, I just have to find tax deductions that, you know, bring that down to there. But Obviously, if you're spending money, that's going to you're not going to get all of that money back from, I mean, tax deduction. A tax deduction is not a dollar for dollar decrease in your taxes is what I'm saying. So you're still losing money if you have a tax deduction. But the awesome thing about doing Uber and Lyft is it has a similar not I don't want to go too far with this, but it has a similar benefit to real estate in the sense that 
you can get a tax deduction for money you did not spend. The way you do that is through the standard mileage rate. The standard mileage rate basically assumes a certain amount of uh, expenses. You know what I'm saying? So if you drive 10,000 uh, 10, miles, you might get, I can't remember the exact number right by now, but it's like 58 cents per mile or something like that. Hmm. So you might get basically, you know, if you're not actually spending 58 cents per mile in effect, then you're actually getting a tax deduction for expenses that you never paid. So a lot of the times I'm doing Uber and Lyft, I'm doing running a lot of miles. So that means I'm getting a lot of basically a very large tax deduction for expenses I didn't actually have. And I'm doing it legally because because that's just the way the tax law is set up. You can you if you have the if you use the standard mileage rate, you are if you and you spend less money than what that standard mileage rate is giving you, then you are paying for you're basically getting a tax deduction for expenses you didn't have. And then also with depreciation and depreciation is factored into the standard mileage rate for the record. But if you were not to take the standard mileage rate and to do actual expenses, you can still take depreciation and depreciation is not a cash expense. It's the same thing with real estate. You're depreciating real estate over a course of time, which is not a cash expense, which lowers your taxes without necessarily lowering your cash flow. Okay. So I was going to say that that's what you're describing with Uber is essentially the same thing as depreciation with real estate. Yeah, in 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 some ways, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So, like, in the example of online business, say someone starts up a you know a Shopify store, they're doing drop shipping, and they make they make thirty thousand dollars profit near the end of the year. If they take that thirty thousand dollars and they go and they buy another drop shipping store at the end of the year, so they made or, you, know, you know whatever. Say they made $40,000, they kept 10, their income was $10,000, and they took that 30 and spent it and bought another store. Does that actually mean that they're getting a deduction and they only made 10,000 according to taxes? Well, I think that would depend on how the transaction was done, but my presumption would be it would be that would be more similar to like you know, probably like buying a stock, for example, because when you're buying a stock, you're buying a business. A lot of people forget that, honestly. But when you're buying a stock, you're buying a business and you don't get any tax write offs for buying a stock. It doesn't count it as an expense. Even if you're a business, you don't get a write off for buying a stock, per se. So I will look at that. That's probably more just going to go to the basis of the business. So when you spend $30,000 to, uh, to buy a business, that $30,000 is going to go into the basis in that business. And that depends on how the business entity is set up and mm -hmm. a bunch well, of factors. Technically, but, I mean, technically, couldn't it be something else? Couldn't you say it's like advertising or something if you're buying a business that's uh, related to what you already have? Yeah, you could do that, but the IRS, if they if you do get audited, that probably won't stand in court. They would they would probably okay. say that's not advertisement. You're buying a business, and so. That probably okay. wouldn't stand in court, most likely. I mean, there are probably ways. If I sat here and thought about it hard and hard enough, that um, you could find a way to get some type of tax benefit from that. Like, yes, say for example, maybe if you're buying, if you depending on how you buy the company, like if you're buying individual assets of that company, maybe some of those assets would be depreciable in the first year. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you'd be able to write those off in the first year. If you're buying individual assets, like for example, you're buying a, uh, I don't know, a, a a business, a farming business, and that farming business, I don't know, has like tractors or something. Maybe you might be able to write that tractor off or part of that tractor off in the first year. If you're buying the tractor, you're buying the land, you're buying each one of these parts of the business individually. Um, maybe, but um, I would have to think about that more and look into that. But for the most part, it would just go into the basis of the business, and you wouldn't be able to. Take an immediate tax deduction for that. Okay, and I'm, to clarify, um, I'm when I when I say buying a business, there are different like brokerage companies online that 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 specialize in selling online businesses. So mm. it's like you know we have we have websites, we have a whole portfolio of websites that earn us money. We can go and sell that a particular website with the brokerage company for a multiple, and so someone can go and buy my website, say for thirty thousand dollars. And now they have, you know, they'll be earning that, uh, that income. So if I buy it for $30,000, chances are it's earning around a thousand dollars a month. 
That's a pretty good return on investment. I guess I don't know about off we, topic. Well, yeah. yeah, right now, you know, because of you know online businesses, I guess they're viewed as more risky, and I there is risk to them for sure. But yeah, the online businesses now will sell anywhere between like a two two to four yearly multiple. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I yeah. honestly don't know how I don't know how it's classified because we haven't, we haven't really bought. I mean, we bought like two websites, but they were both like really small, so mm. I didn't even have like a full on conversation about like how to properly classify it so i don't yeah i don't know it's something we'd have to actually talk to our accountant with if we ever buy like a big website but well, even if you buy a small website it might be worth it to ask your accountant about it i would uh, my assumption is that there's there's probably no immediate tax benefits to that uh as far as like a tax deduction from that but there might be something that I'm missing. With it that. Depends. So, now, so for example, here, I think here, what Mike was talking about here is in a way where it could be classified as like advertising or something. So say, say I own a drop shipping store and I sell mm. mattresses, right? And then I go buy, there's this blog for sale that talks all about mattresses. I would like sleep or something on for sale on one of these brokerage sites. And then mm. I go buy the blog. And then I use the blog for advertising for my drop shipping site. In a way, it's not like you're buying a business in the traditional sense. You're buying the, uh, you know, the, the real the, the website real estate. Yeah, you're kind of just buying. It's almost like buying like like pages in like a magazine or something. It's like pages in the Google index. So I don't know how yeah, it would be classified, but that's I think that's kind of what we're talking about. I wasn't sure if you're totally familiar with what we were talking about. So I just wanted to clarify that. You got a cute dog. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, don't know she, I don't know how she got down here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that would be kind of the same thing, but that's like intangible assets at that point. You know what I'm saying? It's you, when you buy a company, there's intangible assets with that company. And I think that that would be in, a, in effect, you buying intangible assets. And consequently, I don't, I don't know if that would, be able to be classified as an average time. The, the expenses you incur because of having that blog might, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, it'd be something good to talk to your CPA about. From what I understand and what I've researched, I don't, I don't know, but yeah. I, I, don't, that's I, don't, just, I don't know either. I don't know either. We're focused. Know, yeah, on, I was just asking. I mean, focused on we probably had this sites. conversation years ago yeah. and I don't remember it at all, but. Come um, again? I said we're more focused on selling sites than like buying them. You know, we'd rather like build them from the, from zero because it's so much cheaper anyway yeah, unless like it. unless it is a situation like that where it just makes so much sense to add it into our portfolio because now even though you said you know two to four x yearly is a pretty good return on investment now it's even better if one we there's like a clear hole in the business that we have the skills to improve so now it's almost like a like a house flipper situation you know yeah. you're you're a, you're a contractor, you buy a house, you already know what it's going to take to fix it, how much it's going to be worth at the end. So you can create that equity or we already have um, a business where it makes sense that this will immediately add to the bottom, the the revenue of another business. So now the return will be even quicker. Um, it's kind of like activist investing, but with online businesses. What, what was that? Yeah. Activists? Yeah, it's kind of like activist investing. It's kind of like- What is that? I, so basically, activist investing is very similar to what you described, except for usually they're buying a portion of the business instead of the entire business. But what you do is they buy a very large percentage, like maybe 30 percent. Sometimes it's 50 percent. And what they try to do is they either try to change management or there's something wrong with the business that they think that if they fix that, the value of the stock will be significantly more. Not necessarily the price immediately, but the value of the, the stock will go up. And what they try to do is they try to shift those, make those changes to get the value out of that. And that's essentially basically the same thing that you guys are doing, except for maybe you're buying the entire company. But even then, that still could be considered, in a way, activist investing. And now, activist investing necessarily doesn't mean like, oh, we're protesting in the in the streets about uh, whatever. <laughs> it's kind of like an investment strategy. Yeah, <laughs> this is funny, Joe. First, uh. First penny appearance on the Build Assets Online uh, podcast. So, <laughs> if, she, if she has anything to say, she'll she'll chime in. I'm sure. I was going to ask. Hopefully, she has some good investment advice. <laughs> well, yeah, penny, what, what do you like investing in? 
Uh, <laughs> I don't know what she, she doesn't really like investing in anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's trying to learn the themes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, we, we consider what we were describing. Um, we almost look at it as like a little private equity company that we're creating mm -hmm. for ourselves. We're in, we're having this portfolio of different little micro businesses that are technically just websites all under our one business that each earn income and they can work together or, you know, we can sell one separately. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's also like a different part of it is even, even just the, the act of acquiring say, you know, we had the mattress um, e-commerce store and now we acquired the mattress blog. So those, those two separately will be valued lower individually than if we're selling them both together, because now the, the revenue source is more reliable because you have, uh, traffic coming from the blog, you have traffic coming from the paid, you know, you're doing paid traffic to the regular site. So you're, you're diversifying just in that and you'll be able to sell it for more just out the gate. Um, yeah. So that that's the whole cool, is worth more than the sum of its parts. Correct. That, that, that kind correct. of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that actually seems like very smart. And I feel like as far as you said, it's kind of like a private equity company. It really is a private equity company just in a modern modern day way in a smaller scale than maybe some of these billion dollar more uh, private equity companies. I mean, you guys are buying at what are, in a, you know, well, at least for tax purposes, uh, businesses and you guys, they're private businesses and you guys are using your money and you're doing it to make money and you're selling them later on. That's private equity to me. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of threw a wrench in my idea that buying those businesses would inherently be a deduction, but is there anything else that someone can do that could possibly add to the cash flow of the business while being a deduction? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, well, that, that is, that's hard to say. Cause I, I mean, the only thing that I could think Oh, just off the top of my head, obviously, this is kind of off the top of my head. But I mean, if you can do something that is spend money in a way that is going to make you money, if ideally quickly, then that will be one way. Like, for example, one of the most simple examples, not necessarily the best, but the one simple example is advertising. If you advertise for the business, then that is a way that could or could not make you more money than you spent over the course of time mm -hmm. but uh, and that will also lead to an immediate deduction so you're making more money because you spent it yes say you spend for every one dollar advertising you you spend you make a dollar fifty cents and so now you get to write off that dollar that you spent but you made a uh, dollar fifty cents which is you know that fifty percent uh profit yeah and uh, that's like well, profit. i mean with the with the advertising that we do it's kind of hard to just like up it for a, like a, like an amount of time at the end of the year because they're usually the advertising that we do we're getting pretty immediate returns on it like if we're spending x amount of money a day we want to make that much money back a day or at least like on a weekly basis we're looking at it so i think you know i think the website acquisition thing becomes tricky because like we're getting really into the weeds here but i was thinking if you buy a site say you buy a blog site and then you 301 redirect the site to your existing domain. So it's, then it's like, I don't know how familiar you are with website stuff, but it's basically just like you had this one website that you bought from someone, you merged it into your current website, which gives it like better rankings in Google because it passes like all of the, 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 the links and stuff going to one site and now it passes it to your site. So basically all the power goes from one site to your site. So is I, I yeah. in that case, are you still talking? You're still talking about like the uh, the advertising expense thing in terms of buying a website. Yeah, it seems like a gray okay. area, gray area to me. Um, it definitely seems like a gray area. Like, you know, what are you, they're gonna IRS is gonna take you to court, and then you know you have to testify and talk about link juice or something. Like, yeah, it, you it are. Seems like it, the yeah. internet is so it, like what we're talking about right now is such like it's so unlikely that two people are going to have, or one person is going to have expertise on both of those things, you know, like the complexities of SEO and online business and also the complexities of, of the tax law. Yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely want to work on that. <laughs> I mean, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think that one of the people in the little chat here was saying that it, it, they think that it's uh, it would be a bit bit of a stretch as well. So I don't know if that person is. Uh, I think Tom Hunter. I don't know if that person is a tax person or not. You know, tax. But yeah, I think that it probably would probably would be a bit of a stretch as well. But I think that it, who knows? It, it might be possible. It, who well, knows? Also. There's the you can also um, like if you buy articles for your website, like you you pay someone to make a bunch of blog articles for your website. That's advertising as well, is it not? Oh yeah, well that's definitely that could definitely be an immediately deductible expense if you're buying uh, like articles like that. Then then yeah, so that, yeah, it, it can get so, weird. It can definitely get weird. Yeah, so you just bought all the articles that the other site had. Yeah, that it. I think that. Well, once you're buying all of the articles that they have, I think that looks more like a like a acquisition at that point. But if you're buying one and they're still in business for themselves, because then it really you have to think about who uh, exchange of ownership, who owns the articles in total, like who owns the production of the articles, so to speak. And if you guys now own the production of the articles, then you guys made an acquisition, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like the difference of buying a cheeseburger and buying a McDonald's franchise. Right. In a weird way, maybe. Right. Well, I think um, I think we are we are coming to a bit of a, a breakthrough moment here is that if you're doing the dropshipping site, you know, it's a good to not be in the gray area at all. You're doing the, you have this mattress site. You say, screw it. I'm going to create my own mattress site. And you order you made $30,000 and you're really good at SEO because you've taken the advanced blog blast off course from Bell Assets Online. You can go and spend $30,000 to get these articles written. And so now that that separate asset or that those articles, you can make them into a website that will now bring you traffic and bring you revenue, not just to that site, but to your other mattress site. So do that, do you, do you agree that that would, uh, that would work yeah that sounds like that would be more likely to significantly more likely to work if you, you just spend thirty thousand dollars and buy articles from that company i mean not from that company but like you pay um like a writing service to write articles for you yeah oh yeah that i mean that at that point you you're you're basically you're buying a service so at that point that's tax deductible at that point yeah yeah so i think that's yeah, i mean that yeah. definitely i for me as a tax professional i always try to make sure i don't get in trouble for doing stupid stuff with people's tax returns and you always every tax preparer makes a mistake at some point i don't care if they have you know a, a hundred thousand iq but i try to be somewhat you know m not make stupid mistakes but i would definitely be willing to do that on someone's tax return if they spend that type of money they bought a service from somebody that is a tax deductible expense first year yeah so that's why we recommend people your account your your tax professional is going to be your your best friend in your business life i at least i think um well I that's agree. kind of the reason why I, one of the things i wanted to mention is that one of the reasons why i wanted to get into taxes is because i first off my mom uh was doing taxes i knew nothing about but i knew my mom did taxes so i just felt like that would be some generational uh knowledge loss as soon as she you know passes away inevitably as we all will I feel like she, you know, that knowledge is just going away and no one else in the family knows how to do taxes. So now we're all going to, I don't know, Jackson Hewitt or, you know, <laughs> H&R Block or Liberty Tax or some of these other places. When if she would have just, you know, if someone would have just learned her taxes from her, we would have been able to do something. So most of the things I know about taxes, I learned, I learned not from her, but I would say that I still learned, you know, the beginnings from her and I still learn from time to time things from her. But that was one of the reasons why. Another reason why is because I kept hearing everyone say, and this might be a little bit controversial, but I kept hearing everybody say that Trump pays nothing in taxes. And for me, the type of person I am, I'm like, how can I do that myself? I'm like, all right, I'm going to let y'all complain about that. And I'm going to go read this here tax book <laughs> and try to figure out how I can pay nothing in taxes. Because, I mean, and then and, and I, technically I haven't paid income taxes since. And then on the state level, my income tax rate was my income tax rate was negative. So that means, in fact, the state paid me money. So for yeah. me, I feel like um, 
I don't know. Learning learning the tax law has significant significant uh, benefits as far as for yourself. Yeah, you can do other people's taxes, but if you know the tax laws yourself, first off, you can check your tax preparer if they're saying something stupid. Because I can guarantee you, every once in a while, your tax preparer is going to say something stupid. And less, I mean, obviously, the more skilled they are, the less likely it's going to happen. But you might be thinking of ways to make your taxes lower that your tax preparer is not necessarily thinking about. So knowing the tax laws can increase your net income, so to speak, even if you're an employee. So so that's one of the things with me. I was like, I wanted to learn the tax law so I can lower my taxes, maybe not to zero, but I wanted to lower my taxes some way, shape or form. And that's one of the reasons why. And I think that it has paid off in and of itself. Just knowing how to lower my taxes has paid off more than I ever could have imagined. Not even including the money I made from doing people's taxes at the company that I worked for and on top of doing taxes on the side. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you said it best. I mean, to me, understanding taxes is truly understanding, like we said before, the rules of the game of creating financial freedom. And so if you don't understand the rules, how are you going to win? So I think, um, you know, we can we can wrap it up here. It's been nearly an hour and 15, but. Yeah, I mean that that was very insightful, and um, yeah, you're a very bright guy, and we we appreciate you coming on. Yes, thank you, uh, Black Vito. By the way, just uh, to wrap things up, where'd you come up with the name? If your name is uh, Jerome. Yes. So when I first started my YouTube channel, it, my YouTube channel was called Simeon's Think, which uh, wasn't the best name. Uh, but what was it called? Simeon Think. I, I, I still like it, kind of. But so eventually I changed the name because I, I, I like the I'm not sure if you guys ever seen this movie, but uh, The Godfather. Well, The Godfather one and Godfather two, The Godfather and Godfather one is his name is Vito Corleone. Yeah. So with him, it wasn't, you know, if you actually watch that movie, it's not like a shoot 'em up type of movie, as some people might actually think just if they've never seen it, they just heard about Godfather. They hear it's a mafia movie. They assume this is a shoot 'em up movie. It's actually kind of a very slow movie, but just some of the things that he did and said in the, especially the second one, but also the first one as well. It just, it, I just liked some of those things that he said, and it's kind of hard to go exactly into detail, but I just like the things that he said and did in that. It's kind of is a fictional character, so I'm not naming myself as someone who's real. So I'm just kind of like some of those things that he said and did. And one of the things I like mostly is that he kind of started from the bottom, came over from Italy started from the bottom and one of the things that he did was he would always look out for his people his people when they first came over a lot of the italians first came over they were kind of considered second class citizens and he was able to you know come up in his own right and actually help the people his own people so that's one of the one of the reasons why there's other reasons why but um that's one of the things that i liked Okay, cool. Yeah, I was wondering. It sounds like an Italian thing. Yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I think we got into a lot of interesting stuff. Um, anyone watching this, you know, can can learn a lot, whether it's about taxes or if it's about online business, because there's we we we, should, we laid a little golden golden nugget, golden egg here that may people people may not catch on to when it comes to uh, SEO, cool. but you know, the, the drop shipping and, you know, all the online business stuff is covered in, uh, our membership, but yeah, if people want to learn more about that, they can go to build assets, online.com slash playbook. That's our free course where we teach people about the business models that we do. And, um, it's a de definitely a naturally good extension to what we talked about here. And, um, where can people find you, Jerome? Me, I am on YouTube, Black Vito, Moneyology. I'm working on a second YouTube channel that's not necessarily money related, but probably have a lot of money related things because I just like talking about money. It's called Black Vito Show and Podcast. I haven't really worked on that channel that much, but I'm going to start working on it very soon. So, but the main channel, Black Vito Moneyology. And then also, you can follow me on Instagram, Black Vito underscore. And then, um, yeah, that's that's the main places to follow me. All right. I do have a Facebook. I don't want you guys to follow me there. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but yeah, so Instagram, uh, Instagram and um, and YouTube. 
Al Black Vito. There you have it, folks. Hope hope you all have enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the show. And uh, that's it. That's all I got. Yep. Awesome. Take Sounds it easy, good. guys. <laughs>